Hi everyone. So class got canceled due to snow. Uh, we were going to cover chapter three tonight. So hopefully this video works and I can send it to y'all and you guys can learn chapter three from this video. So chapter three is going to be all about how to find the center and spread of our data. Last week, we started talking, we said that when you deal with numerical data, you use three things to describe your distribution, the shape, the center, and the spread. Last week, we talked about the shape. We learned how to create a histogram and determine if it's symmetric or skewed. We learned some other things, but the two main things that we're going to focus on this class is, is your data symmetric or is it skewed? Depending upon whether your data is symmetric or skewed, you will use different methods to find your center and your spread. So our center, we're going to think of it as the typical value that you can expect to see for that data. The spread is considered the horizontal variability or how much change is there horizontally in your data. So we're going to focus today just on how to find center and spread if your data is symmetric or if it's skewed. So in the first couple sections, we're going to focus on symmetric distributions. In 3.1, we'll start with the measure for the center, and then we'll move on to variability. So for the center, of a symmetric distribution, we use what's called the mean. It's commonly thought of as a balancing point for your distribution. So in the most basic version of a dot plot, you could find the balancing point or mean by having half the data values on the left-hand side, half the data values on the right-hand side, and then right there in the center between all of them would be your mean. It's a little weird to look at them that way. I think it's easier to think about them mathematically. So the mean is something that y'all probably solved a million times. You just may not have heard it called a mean. The mean is you're simply finding the average of all your data. So what you'll do is you'll take all the data values and add them up. And then you'll divide all the data values that you added up by how many values you have. So we're going to write some mathematical equation here, but I wanted y'all to have the verbal description. So if you add up your data values, remember your data values are your X's. And if you remember that Greek letter sigma means that you're going to sum or add up whatever it's next to. So the mean is going to have a symbolization of X with a bar on top of it. So we call it X bar. So it's, I know, not too fancy, not too interesting. So X bar or the mean equals the sum of all of your data values divided by the number of data values that you have and that will be symbolized by n. So the number of data values you have is n. This will be your equation for finding the mean. You can use it for small data sets, for large data sets. Um, if you were dealing with a population, you'd solve it the exact same way, they just might change the notations a little bit. But typically adding up a whole bunch of data values, like if you had 300 people in your study, it takes time to add up 300 data values. So we're also going to learn how to use technology because the larger your data set, the more tedious the math becomes. So let's try solving some of these by hand. The data in the table represents the first exam scores of 10 students enrolled in a section of introductory statistics. We're going to compute the population mean. So 
If you remember the example, the equation we just talked about, we said it's x bar equals the sum of your x's divided by the number of samples that you have. They said we had 10 students. So that means that we have 10 data values. The scores that they got on the test are their x's. So if we look at this table, if we get the total for that column, that is the sum of all your data values x. So I'm just going to add all of those data values up. 82 plus 77 plus 90 plus 71 plus 62 plus 68 plus 74 plus 84 plus 94 plus 88. If you add all of those together, you get 790. So to compute this mean, we're going to add up our data values and divide by how many there were. We added them up. There were 790. There were 10 data values. So 790 divided by 10 is 79. Therefore, the mean of this data that they gave us was 79. Now, we're looking at this data as if it, those 10 students were my population. So pretending that that's the only stats class I taught that semester with those 10 students. If I wanted to find a sample mean from those students, I could pick four students to look at. And so let's say I picked four of the students. I picked uh, Bilal, Rian, Pam, and Michelle. So just the first four students. So to find the sample mean for those four students, I'm no longer looking at the table. I'm now only looking at these four exam scores. So I want to find the sum of these data values and divide by how many there were. So 90 plus 77 plus 71, plus 82, and there were four of them. If I add those four data values together, it's 320, and if I divide by four, I get 80. So we didn't test it here, but this data was symmetric. So therefore, when I take samples out of symmetric data, the samples tend to be symmetric as well. So we tend to be able to say, okay, if samples are symmetric, the populations are probably symmetric too, and vice versa. If the population is symmetric, that probably means the sample is going to be symmetric. And as we continue on in the course, those are things that we look for to know which types of tests to do. Another example, this one comes from your book. Suppose a sample of prices for one gallon of regular gas at 10 different gas stations in a neighborhood in Austin, Texas, is taken on a fall day in 2013. They want us to find and interpret the mean. So if you look in your book, they give you a dot plot of the distribution to show that it's roughly symmetric. but we can find the mean. So looking at these data values. First thing we have to do, we write our equation. Our mean is found by adding up all of our data values and dividing by how many data values there are. So I'm gonna count how many data values I have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I know that the number of data values I have, n, is 10. I also want to find the sum of all my data values. Now, if you look back at that last example, just having four data values written in a row on the top already made a pretty big equation, and it makes it a little bit harder to look at. So I tend to break my equation up and solve for things and then put them back together. 
So I'm going to solve for the sum of my data values and then plug it back in. So I'm going to add together $3.19 plus 309 plus 309 plus 295 plus 309 plus 299 plus 295 plus 297. When you add all of those together, you get 3024. So you can see having all of that in the numerator of a fraction would be a lot to have going on. So like I said, I tend to break it up. So the mean is equal to that sum divided by the number of data values there were. So I'm gonna plug in 30.24 divided by 10. 30.24, if we divide by 10, we get 3.024. So to interpret it, they wanted us to interpret it, uh, we can say that the typical uh, let's see, it was gas price in Austin, Texas on this day. was three dollars and two cents if you want to get really technical if you remember if you ever look at a gas station they always have like an extra little number off in the corner how many tenths of the next cent they charge you so you could say 3.02 and four tenths if you really wanted um but let's just stick with dollars and cents in my answer because it just makes it simpler for you guys to see so Next, your calculator. How do we solve this in your calculator? So in our calculator, you'll press the stat button. You'll choose the first option, which is edit. And you'll enter all of your data values into your list. Once you've entered all the data values into your list, typically you want to use list one, you'll then press stat again, and you'll use your arrow keys to go over to the calculate menu. From the calculate menu, you're going to choose the very first option. It says one var stats. This is your one variable statistics. It's going to calculate a whole bunch of things for a single column of data. The very first thing that it gives you is the mean. It says X bar equals and gives you a number. So let's try solving this for that last example we were just looking at. So we're gonna press that and choose edit and enter our data. So let me grab my keyboard. We're gonna say 3.19, 3.09, 3 3.09, 2.93, 2.95, 3.09, 2.99, 2.99, 2.99, 2.95, and 2.97. Those are my 10 data values. I double check, I doesn't look like I typed it in, it, in anything incorrectly, so I'm gonna press statistics or the stat button. I'll arrow over to calc and choose the very first option, one var stats. Um, some of your calculators will ask you what list. So we're gonna say it's list one, and I'm just gonna arrow down to calculate and hit enter. The very first thing they give me is X bar. So my mean is 3.024, and that's exactly what we found when we solved by hand. One thing that is kind of cool is the next thing they gave you was the sum of all your data values. So if you wanted to work it out by hand and show all of your work, it matched up with what you found as the sum of all your data values. They also give you what N is, how many data values you had, 
They said n is 10. We'd counted 10 data values. So like I said, this one variable statistics is going to give you a lot of information and we're going to continue to use it. Um, we're going to, this is going to be one of those big tests that we do with our data because it's going to end up giving us a lot of things that we solve for. So we now know how to do it in our calculator. Remember that your mean is going to be considered to describe your typical data value and you don't want to use the mean unless your data is considered symmetric. If your data is not considered symmetric, if it's skewed, skewed right or left, you, you're going to say that it's not a good estimate for that typical value or center and you're going to use something else. So if you drew a histogram of your data, such as this one, the distribution shows the salaries of professional baseball players in 2010. Eli, uh-uh. Sorry, y'all. Do you think the mean is a good representation of the typical baseball salaries for that year? Well, our data appears to have most of it happening here, and then it tapers off to the right. Since the data tapers off to the right, this data is skewed right, or right-tailed, whichever way you want to call it. So this, for this data, the mean would not be a good representation. So if, you, if this is what you were studying, you would have to say, okay, I can't use the symmetric rules, I can't use the mean, I'm going to have to go with a different measure for the center. Um, when we continue on in this chapter, I'll end up showing you why this isn't good. Basically, those data values on the right pull your mean away from where the center of most of your data is happening. So we end up learning other methods for measuring that will give you a more accurate determination of what's happening with most of your data. So now that we've talked about what's happening at the center, we're going to talk about what's happening with the spread. If you recall, we said that, that variability in a distribution can be measured by the horizontal spread. So we're trying to figure out how, mm, you could say variable the data is, that's what your book's going for, but more or less, we're basically trying to figure out how far is the data from the center? How much change is there in your data values throughout time? Assigning a number to your horizontal spread is not very straightforward. There are a lot of different ways you can assign a measure for horizontal spread, but there's one that is considered the most common. It's used in every basic statistics book. This, um, so what we're going to study is called our standard deviation, but we're going to talk about spread a little bit more first. So measuring the spread. If we were to look at these two histograms, these histograms record the daily high temperatures in Fahrenheit for one year at two different locations. The left-hand graph in blue is for Provo, Utah. The right-hand graph in kind of a yellowy color is San Francisco, California. We want to know just the basic information about them. Uh, if we look at them, both of them look to be basically symmetric. They curve up and back down pretty much evenly on both sides. They might be a little bit leaning heavy to one side or the other, but it's mostly symmetric. Second, if you were to find the mean for each of these graphs, it, for Provo, it's at about 67, so right about here. For San Francisco, it falls at about 65. So both of them have roughly pretty darn close to having the same average temperature throughout the entire year but their spread for their distributions is very different. 
If you look at Provo, it's more spread out, it's wider. So the data values are farther from their center. In San Francisco, they're narrower, they're less spread out. And the data values are closer to the center. So what can you kind of determine by that spread? Well, that means that Provo has a much wider range of temperatures throughout the year. Some, sometimes they get really hot. They have temperatures that are at like 105 and they get really cold. They have temperatures that are close to zero in that year. Whereas San Francisco, they're a little more temperate. Their temperatures don't change that much throughout the year. Their temperatures range from high 40s to high 80s. You might have a few days at 90, but their temperatures don't change that much. So that's, so this um, measure of spread really does give us really useful information. But when you're just looking at it as a, as a number, you're like, why do I even care? <laughs> so um, putting it in terms of an example really helps you guys to see why it's kind of an important thing to know. Because I mean, if you were trying to decide where you wanted to live, um, you might not like really hot temperatures at 105 degrees or really cold temperatures. Or maybe you really love having all the seasons and all the weather. In that case, you'd like Provo. If you didn't really like temperature changes and you wanted it to be, you know, nice, um, not very cold, not very hot all year long, you might choose San Francisco. Measures of spread. So we, I already mentioned that the measure of spread that we're going to use for our symmetric distributions is going to be the standard deviation. This standard deviation, um, if you notice the word standard in it, so it is a, it is a mathematical um, number that people were able to come up with. I'm not going to bore you guys with all the details on how they came up with it, how they derived the equation or anything like that. But basically what happened is they wanted to be able to come up with a way to solve so that um, they could always measure the majority of their da data being within this one mathematical value away from their mean. So they came up with a standard deviation. And I'm going to explain it to you guys a little bit in the next section, but the majority of your data is always going to be within one standard deviation from your mean. So if you can find what that standard deviation is equal to, you'll always be able to know where the major this range of numbers that the majority of your data is going to fall between. So think of your standard deviation as a unit of measurement. Uh, you don't know what it equals until you solve for it, but this this measuring stick that you have will always tell you, okay, if I go that far above my mean and that far below my mean using this measured stick of standard deviation, most of my data will always fall within that range of numbers. So I wrote a note here, think of the, whoops, think of the standard deviation as the typical distance for your observations from their mean. So let's look at an example. The graph below shows the distribution of the amount of particulate matter or smog in the air in 333 cities in the U.S. in 2008. Uh, this is actual data reported by the Environmental Protection Agency. So if we look at these 333 cities, if they put them into a frequency histogram by how many particulates you measured and how common it was, the mean particulate matter they solved, they found it to be 10.7 micrograms per cubic meter. So they're saying at about 10.7, uh, so maybe somewhere around in here, or this, this really tall column, they're saying that's basically where your mean is. And they say most of your data is going to fall within 2.6 micrograms per cubic meter because that's what the standard deviation is. So what you're basically saying is that, here, let me switch colors, 10.7 plus 2.6 will give us, Three, uh, I'm sorry, 13.3. <laughs> .3. So 
so right about here, and 10.7 minus 2.6 is, I believe, 8.1. So we'll go somewhere around right here, I believe. So they're saying in between these two spots for measuring particles, they're saying that in between those, that's one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below the mean. So if we're looking at it, we're saying that the most common data values that you find will fall between 8.1 and 13.3 micrograms per cubic meter because your standard deviation tells you a unit of measurement above and below where you're considering most of your data to fall. So we expect most of our data to fall between 8.1 and 13.3. Now, they give us a little more information. They say that the EPA says that the levels over 15 micrograms per cubic meter are considered unsafe. So what can we conclude about the air quality for most of the cities in the sample? Since one standard deviation above the mean was only 13.3, we know that most of our cities fell within what the EPA considers to be safe smog particulate matter measurements. So we'd be able to say that we conclude the air quality for most cities in this sample are considered acceptable by the EPA or something like that. So how do we find the standard deviation? The standard deviation formula is very intimidating to look at. The formula for the standard deviation is, standard deviation is, has a, um, it's denoted or its symbol is S. If you remember our data values, are our X's, we just learned how to find our mean, which we said we symbolized by X with a bar over it. So we'll call it X bar. And the number of data values is N. So when we look at this, our standard deviation equals the square root of the sum of x minus the mean squared over n minus 1. It's a very intimidating equation. But if you do like I did with the mean and you break it down into parts, it becomes much easier to manage. So on the next slide, I actually broke it down into seven steps that you guys can follow, and you'll always get your standard deviation. So we're going to start at the very inside of our equation inside those parentheses, x minus x bar. So you're going to take each data value and you'll subtract the mean from it. So I suggest creating a table. Put your data into a table, all of your x values into one column, and then in the very next column, um, so we'll find our mean if they haven't given it to you. That will be our step one, find the mean. Step two in that second column from what we've created you're going to take each data value and subtract the mean from it. Then you're going to create a third co column where you will square each of your answers. In step four, you're going to add up that entire column of answers that you found. That is that numerator, the sum of each data value minus the mean squared. In step five, how many data values did you originally have? That's your n. Take that number and subtract one from it, n minus one. 
you'll then divide what you found in step four, which was the sum of each data value minus its mean squared, by what you just found in step five, which was n minus one. And the last step is you're gonna take the square root of what you found in step six. So you're taking the square root of each data value minus the mean squared over n minus one, which is ultimately what your standard deviation equals. So step by step, we will find our standard deviation. So let's look at that example that we've been looking at a few times already. The sample price for one gallon of gas at 10 different gas stations in one neighborhood of Austin, Texas on that fall day in 2013. We're going to find and interpret the standard deviation. So, to find and interpret the standard deviation, step one, we'll find the mean of our data. We find our mean by saying that it's the sum of all your data values divided by n. This is something that we already found in our previous example. We found that it was equal to 3.024. We added up all of our data values and divided by 10. In step two, they want us to subtract the mean from each data value and add up all of our answers. And step three, square the result. So I'm gonna create a table. The first column is all of my X values. You could create this table before you do any of your steps. Um, that way, if you have to find your mean, you could add up that column of X's. So for this first one, if you total the column, total of all of your X's was 30.24. And if you divide that by 10, you get the 3.024 that we said our mean would be. But now that we've already found it, we move on to step two, which is where we subtract the mean from each data value. We went ahead in this, uh, your book went ahead and rounded to dollars and said that our mean They went to dollars and cents and said it's 3.02. So we're gonna stick with what your book did so that way if you're following along with your book, you should get the same answer. So the data value minus the mean is what I'm gonna label my step two column as. So X minus X bar. So 3.19, if we subtract 3.02, we get 0.17. 3.09 minus 3.02 is 0.07. 3.09 minus 3.02 is 0.07. 2.93 minus 3.02 is going to give me a negative 0 0.09. 2.95 minus 3.02, I get a negative 0.07. 3.09 minus 3.02 is 0 0.07. 2.99 minus 3.02 is a negative 0 0.03. 2.99 minus 3.02 is once again negative 0 0.03. 2.95 minus 3.02 negative 0 0.07 and 2.97 minus 3.02 is a negative 0 0.05. In step three, they told us to take each of those values and square them. So I'm just gonna go down this column, take each data value I just found and square it. 0.17 squared is 0 0.0289. 0 0.07 squared is 0 0.0049. So the same for the next, 0 0.0049. 0 
negative 0 0.09. If I square that, I get a positive number. I get 0 0.0081. Negative 0.07 squared gives me a positive 0 0.0049. Same as positive 0.7 squared, 0.07 squared. So 0 0.0049. Negative 0 0.03 squared will give me 0 0.0009. And I get that same result a second time, 0 0.0009. Negative 0 0.07 squared is 0 0.0049. And negative 0 0.05 squared is 0 0.0025. Step four, they tell me to add up all those solutions I just found. So I'm going to find the total for this column. It's going to equal the sum of each data value minus its mean squared. So when I add them all up, I get 0 0.0658. Step five asks me, how many data values did you originally have? I had 10 data values. They want me to take that number and subtract one. 10 minus one is nine. In step six, they ask me to divide what I found in step four by what I found in step five. What I found in step four was I added up each data value minus its mean squared, and what I found in step five was n minus one. So in step four, I numerically found 0 0.0658. Step five, I found nine. So 0 0.0658, if I divide by nine, I get 0 0.0731111111. One, ones keep going. In step seven, they want me to find the square root of what I just found. They want me to find the square root of that 0 0.0731111. So what I'm actually finding is the square root of the sum of x minus x bar squared over n minus 1. So when I find that square root, I get 0 0.08550035, something like that. So what does this number even mean? I'm going to round my standard deviation. I'm going to say that it's point zero. I want to round to cents, so I look at the number after it. Since it's a five, I round up. So my standard deviation, I'm going to say, is point zero 0.09. We knew the mean was, point, was three dollars and two cents. If the standard deviation is nine dollars, I mean, is nine cents, not nine dollars, so our interpretation is that at most of the gas stations, not all of them, but most of the gas stations, the price of a gallon of gas will be within nine cents of 3.02. So nine cents above and nine cents below is where most of the gas stations will have their price for gas. So how do we find it in a calculator? Using our TI-84 calculator, we're going to do exactly what we did for the mean. We press STAT. We choose the first option, which is EDIT, and enter all of our data values into the first list. So we still have it listed in here from when we found the mean. So we have all of our data values in list one. Then you'll once again press the STAT button and press the arrow to go over to one variable statistics, one var stats, it's the first option. You'll press enter, make sure that it's using list one, 
for the list, and then you'll tell it to calculate. When you do that, you'll notice one of these things says S. It has an X next to it, but this SX, that's the standard deviation for the X values or data values. So the standard deviation for these data values is 0.08540101. If you notice, it's a little different. It's because we used, when we calculated by hand, we used a rounded version of the mean. So we still got basically the exact same answer, but it's slightly different. So I would say typically, if you're going to solve for the mean and then the standard deviation by hand, use at least two decimal places more than you want to give your final answer in. So if you wanted to give your final answer in two decimal places like we did, um, I would have used the longer version of the mean to, um, if it ends before four decimal places, use where it ends. But if it carries on beyond four decimal places, I would use at least four. Um, just because it's going to make your answers more accurate, you'll have less of what we call a rounding error. In our case for this problem, though, we ended up not really having much of a rounding error with the calculator. We found the standard deviation to be 0.08540101148, which we can round to be about 0 0.09 or 9 cents. There is one other measure for spread that most statistics books will reference, and it's something that is found from your standard deviation. It's called your variance. <clears throat> it's not as useful as the standard deviation, um, but it's really easy to solve because all it is is the standard deviation squared. So if you find your standard deviation, the variance is just that number squared. I think it does show up in here. I can't remember. Nope. Okay. It does not show up in your one variable statistics. But you can just take that standard deviation that you found and square it. So it's just going to be symbolized as S squared since S was your standard deviation symbol. And to find the variance, you just square the standard deviation. The variance very simply is denoted as S with a square. So kind of taking this idea of the standard deviation, measuring um, most of your data, how do we know what's usual and unusual? We can use that standard deviation to figure out if data is usual or unusual, because we know what we've already been saying is that most of our data should fall within one standard deviation. So someone wanted to know, um, the person who created, standard deviations was like, okay, well, most of our data falls within one standard deviation. Um, someone was like, okay, well, what does that mean percentage wise? What percent of our data falls in one standard deviation? What falls in two or three? You know, what, how can we use this? So they created this rule called the empirical rule. It's a rough guideline for knowing what percentage roughly it's approximation, will fall within one, two, or three standard deviations from your mean. If your data is symmetric and only has one, is just unimodal, so only one mound. That's what we're going to kind of focus on, unimodal data that's symmetric. So this is kind of written as the percent of data that falls within blank standard deviations of the mean. So for one standard deviation of the mean, 68% of your data will fall within that. So wherever your mean is, if you add one standard deviation to it and then subtract one standard deviation from it, you'd be able to say that 68% of your data falls in that range of numbers, whatever those numbers end up being. If you take your mean, and you add and subtract the standard deviation twice, 
95% of all of your data is expected to fall within those numbers. So whatever that range of numbers is, 95% of your data will fall in there. We never really look beyond three standard deviations because if you take the mean and subtract the standard deviation three times from it, and you add three standard deviations to the mean, you're expecting that 99.7% of your data should fall in between those two numbers. So anything beyond three standard deviations, it's not even a full percentage of data that you would think could fall in there. So we tend to only look at three standard deviations because it just doesn't really matter what's beyond there. So most of our data, more than 50%, falls within one standard deviation. 95% within two standard deviations and darn near all of it within three standard deviations. So how can we use this empirical rule? Well, we can use the empirical rule to draw a curve of and know what our data falls in between. So the data on smog levels in a, that those cities um, was collected and the distribution was roughly symmetric and unimodal. That means that we can use standard deviations and means. So they found the mean particulate level to be 10.7 micrograms. So that's the mean. And they said it had a standard deviation of 2.6. So we know that the mean is 10.7 and the standard deviation is 2.6. We're going to draw that curve, that normal curve, and interpret the results. So we're going to draw a curve that looks like this with a number line on the bottom telling us where our mean is and where each of these standard deviation measurements fall. So I drew a curve. The mean, they said, was at 10.7. So at the very middle, I'm going to put 10.7. And then I'm going to do the math one standard deviation out. So I'm going to take my mean and add my standard deviation to it. So I'm going to make this kind of symmetric as I do it. So I have my mean, which was 10.7. If I take my mean and add a standard deviation, that's 10.7 plus 2.6 which will give me 13.3. So this next number here is 13.3. If I take my mean and I subtract one standard deviation, so 10.7 minus 2.6, that will give me 8.1. So in between 8.1 and 13.3, I expect that 68% of my data will fall in between those two numbers. I'm then gonna go two standard deviations out. So the mean plus two standard deviations. So 10.7 plus two times 2.6. It's gonna give me 15.9. If I take the mean and I subtract the standard deviation twice, I can think of that as the mean minus two standard deviations, or 10.7 minus two times 2.6. It's gonna equal 5.5. So I expect that between the numbers 5.5 and 15.9, I expect 95% of my data, or 95% of those 333 cities, will fall in between those numbers on the smog scale. 
lastly, and we don't really need a vertical axis. Sorry, I put one on there. It's really just going to confuse you guys. So I'll make that go away. So lastly, we want to do three standard deviations. So the mean minus three standard deviations. So 10.7 minus three times 2.6 is going to give me 2.9. So out here at 2.9 and the mean plus two standard deviations So 10 or three standard deviations rather. 10.7 plus 3 times 2.6 will give us 18.5. So I am expecting that if I solve this, 99.7% of all of those data values would fall between 2.9 and 18.5 on a smog scale. So your book interpreted about 68% of the cities will have a smog level between 8.1 and 13.3. 95% of the cities will have a smog level between 5.5 and 15.9. And almost all the cities, 99.7, We'll have a smog level between 2.9 and 18.5. So the empirical rule, if we look at temperatures. So if the mean daily high temperature in San Francisco is 65 degrees Fahrenheit with a standard deviation of 8 degrees Fahrenheit. They want us to find the temperature ranges for 68%, 95%, and 99.7% of the data. So we can use the empirical rule. Then they want us to decide, using what we found, that empirical rule, decide whether it's unusual to have a day where the maximum temperature is colder than 49 degrees in San Francisco. So once again, I'm going to create myself a normal curve. And we're going to start with, they told us that our mean is equal to 65. So I'm going to put that at the center. Then I'm going to take that mean and add a single standard deviation. So 65 plus 8 gives me 73. And I'm going to subtract a single standard deviation. So x minus 1 standard deviation is 65 minus 8, which gives me 57. If I go two standard deviations, so the mean plus two standard deviations, so 65 plus two times eight, I get 81. And the mean minus two standard deviations, so 65 minus two times eight, I get 49. And finally, the mean plus three standard deviations. So 65 plus three times eight is 89. And the mean minus three standard deviations, 65 minus three times eight is 41. So looking at this, Within one standard deviation, I expect 68% of my data. Within two standard deviations, I expect 95% of my data. 
and within three standard deviations, I expect 99.7% of my data to fall in between those numbers. So we can say, if we were to write it out, um, let's see, we expect 68% of daily temperatures to fall between 57 degrees and 73 degrees. We expect 95% of daily temperatures to fall between 49 degrees and 81 degrees. Finally, we're going to expect almost all of them, 99.7% of daily temperatures to fall between 41 degrees and 89 degrees. The part B question they asked us was using what we found here with the empirical rule. Do we think it's going to be unusual to have a day where the maximum temperature is colder than 49 degrees? So I'm going to pull a different color out here so that I can kind of draw something for you guys. So if 99.7% of my data falls within three standard deviations, right? So 99.7 is in between those two. And you can never have more than 100% of data. So if 99.7% of the data falls in between those two numbers, that means that 0.3% falls outside of it. Since this curve is considered symmetric, we're assuming that our data is symmetric, it's evenly falling to the right and to the left. That means that outside of that 99.7, we're expecting, as it continues on to infinity, we're expecting 0.15% on each side outside of there. because 0.3 divided by two, because there's two tails, is 0.15. So if we think about it that way, they want to know, uh, what did they say? Is it unusual to have a maximum temperature colder than 49 degrees Fahrenheit? So I'm going to kind of use that with a little bit different. We're going to instead, I was thinking 41 was what they asked, but they asked for 49. So we're going to think of it differently. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to confuse you guys. Since 95% of the daily high temperatures are between 49 degrees Fahrenheit and 81 degrees Fahrenheit. So you have this curve. And they say between 49 and the other number, I can't remember what it was, 81. 95% of the data falls in between those two. So just like what I just explained, you have 100% of your data. If you know where 95% of it falls, that means 5% of it is falling outside of that range. If you divide by 2, you get 2.5%. So 2.5% is occurring outside in both sides, 2.5 in each tail. So days that are colder than 
are going to be days or numbers to the left of 49 on that number line. We know that only 2.5% of our data falls in that shaded portion, which is to the left of 49. So that means only 2.5% of your days are colder than 49 degrees Fahrenheit. We also know 2.5% of days are warmer than 81 degrees. So having a temperature that is colder than 49 degrees Fahrenheit would be fairly unusual because if someone told me that I only had a 2.5% chance of something happening, I'm not going to be very confident that it happens. It's going to be an unusual occurrence if it happens. So that's how we can figure out a, something that falls on our standard deviation marks. But how do we know what's happening with a data value that isn't 49 or 81 or one of the other numbers that specifically falls on a standard deviation tick mark? If we want to find out what's happening with a different number, we can use something called z-scores. With z-scores, what we're basically going to do is, well, I'll explain that in a minute. I'm going to try to just explain the concept of a z-score first. So this is an example that I've taught in my classes at other schools. At the end of the 2004 season, Boston Red Sox led the American League with 949 runs scored, while the St. Louis Cardinals led the National League with 855 runs scored. If you just quickly compare the two, you might believe that the Red Sox had a better run-producing season. But because they come from two entirely different leagues, it's unfair to compare them directly. So if we were sitting in class, I would ask you, what are some reasons that this could be unfair? I don't really know baseball that well. My husband does. And he told me the two very obvious reasons that this would be unfair would be that they may not play the same number of games in a year and the designated hitter rule. So even if you only have so many, um, what did he say? So many times at bat normally, with a designated hitter, you get to bat more. So an individual person might get to bat more often. I, I, I don't really understand it. Like I said, I don't know baseball. I played softball as a, when I was younger, and they have different rules. So, and I never kept up with it after... I got injured and had to stop playing, so I don't really understand the rules. But basically, to compare the two leagues would be unfair because they come from different populations. They're entirely different groups. So to compare the two leagues, we need to determine their relative standing within their different leagues and, or populations. The way we can, one way we can do this is z-scores. So this is one application of a z-score. So a z-score is going to measure how many standard deviations within their group their observed data value is from the mean. So why do we care about z-scores? Z-scores allow us to compare observations that happen with different distributions. If they're from different populations, different distributions, we can still com compare them if we know the z-scores for the different data values. So let's look at an example. A z-score of 1.5 means that an observed data value is 1.5 standard deviations above the mean in their distribution. If they gave you a z-score of negative 1.5, that means that the data value is 1.5 standard deviations below the mean. So I'm going to try to draw y'all curves so you can see what I'm talking about. And try to make them as uniform as possible. So if this is where your mean falls, one point five standard deviations above, that's one standard deviation, that's two, one point five standard deviations. So x bar plus one point five standard deviations. So that one's falling right about there. 
If they're going down, it would be something about right here. The mean minus 1.5 standard deviations. So if you notice, when it's above the mean, you add however many standard deviations. When it's below the mean, you subtract. So that's kind of where they came up with the idea to use negatives when you're below the standard deviation. So anytime you see a negative number for a z-score, you automatically know that it's below the standard deviation. So let's try looking at, your book wants us to look at them with a dot plot first. So this dot plot shows the heights for a sample of men. So how many men would have a z-score that are greater than two? They gave us this dot plot. They gave us it being spaced out. <clears throat> so one standard deviation is at 73. Two standard deviations is at 76. So how many are greater? There are two data values that are greater. So there are two men that have a z-score that's greater than two standard deviations from the mean. If they want less than negative two, the z-score is negative one at one standard deviation away. Z-score is negative two at two standard deviations away. And once again, we had two data values that fell two standard deviations away. This is a really weird way of looking at z-scores. Um, what they have is the data values here and then the z-scores here. But it kind of outlines something that's very interesting. If you see at the mean, they told you that it's zero z-scores away. At one standard deviation, they use the number one. And at two standard deviations, they use the number two. So this is actually something that is important. One of the reasons z-scores are useful is because no matter what data values we have for our means and standard deviations, we can convert it into these z-scores. And basically what I, the way I was always taught to think of it as is that you're taking your original, um, where is it? You're taking your original data values, uh, I'll look through those later. You're taking your original data values on its curve and you're converting it to a normal curve that would have a mean at zero and standard deviations at one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three. And so there actually ends up being a table for that curve that we can find percentages for what percent of the data falls to the left of any data value. So if you wanted to know where, say, uh, let's say, um, I don't know, I wish these were evenly spaced. Okay, so let's say you wanted to know, all right, this is a data value that falls right there in that column. And you're saying, okay, well, what percentage of data or what percentage of people's heights are shorter than that height, whatever height that column represents? You want to know what percentage of people are shorter. Well, we can't really find it with that curve, but you'd be able to take it from where it fell on that curve and convert it to this one. And we have a table that we'll be able to read that will tell us what percentage falls below for any z value that you have. Positive, negative, any number. So it ends up becoming very useful for that as well, not just comparing two different sets of data, but finding um, percentages for specific values within your data. So I'm going to go back to the book and doing it in the order that they want us to talk about it. 
So um, an example, suppose the road A has a mean speed of 60 miles per hour. It has a standard deviation of five miles per hour. So the mean is 60, the standard deviation is five. This is for road A, so I'm gonna put a little A next to it. They tell us road B has a mean speed of 60 and a standard deviation of 10. They want to know if you have a driver on road A and a driver on road B. Relatively speaking, based upon how people drive on those roads, which one's going faster or slower? So, road A is at, has a mean of 60 miles per hour with standard deviations of five. So mean plus a standard deviation, so 60 plus five is 65. And then the mean plus two standard deviations is 70. Three standard deviations is 75. If we subtract mean minus one standard deviation, so x bar minus s, 60 minus five is 55. 60 minus two times five is 50. 60 minus three times five is 45. On road B, if we make our curve, the mean is 60 miles an hour. Standard deviation is 10. So it's going up and down by increments of 10. So 70, 80, 90 are my three standard deviations above. Three standard deviations below, we subtract 10 each time. So 50, 40, and 30. So now that I have a curve, I'm gonna look back at what they asked me. They asked me, is a driver that's going 70 miles an hour, on which road would they be going faster? So 70 miles an hour. I'm gonna mark that on each of the number lines below my curve. So on the first curve for road A, 70 is two standard deviations above the mean. On road B, 70 miles per hour is one standard deviation above the mean. So since on road A, It's two standard deviations. The driver on road A is going faster as compared with his fellow drivers. Now, technically speaking, if both of them had the same speed limit, they're both speeding and you're both going to get a ticket. But, <laughs> but based upon how fast other drivers are going, there are cops that won't pull you over if you're going with the flow of traffic. So with that kind of idea, that's where a question like this would come into play. Um, because on road B, um, 95 or no, 68% of people would, fall, would go 50 to 70 miles an hour. And on road A, 95% of people are going between 50 and 70. So a lot wider range in speeds, so you're gonna stand out more. So you're gonna be going faster as compared to the majority of the other people on the road who are going 60. And that means that the cop is more likely to pull you over because you're, you look like you're going much faster than most of the other people. You're gonna, they're gonna be like, oh, that car is flying and they're gonna pull you over. So although both drivers are traveling at 70 miles an hour, the driver on road A is traveling relatively faster since 70 miles per hour is two standard deviations above the mean on road A. And 70 miles per hour is only one standard deviation above the mean on road B. So how do we find a Z-score so that we can compare 
data. A z-score, it's symbolized by a z, we're going to take a data value, whatever data value we're looking at. We're going to subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. So you'll take whatever data value you're looking at, you're trying to figure out how far is it from the mean and divide by the standard deviation. And what this basically does is it converts it from the curve that it was originally in into that curve that we have right there. So it ends up giving us where it falls on um, a lot of books refer to it as the standard normal curve, where the mean is at zero and each standard deviation is one. And so once you find that z-score, you're able to put multiple data values. So if you were thinking back to um, the baseball example, they came from different populations. So they're from entirely different histograms that you would be looking at. But if you found the z-score for a specific player from each league and wanted to compare those two players, you could say, okay, well, this player falls here and this player falls here. So the second player did better than the first player. You could do something like that. So let's look at this. Instead of looking at a specific player, we're going to look at specific teams. We're going to determine whether the Boston Red Sox or the St. Louis Cardinals had a relatively better run producing season. The Red Sox scored 949 runs and they play in the American League. In the American League, the mean number of runs was 811.3 and the standard deviation was 73.7. So I'm going to stop right there and write down what they gave me. They told me the Red Sox scored 949 runs. That is my data value that I'm looking at because it's the data for this team that I want to um, study. So my data value X is 949. They told me the mean X bar is 811.3 and the standard deviation S is 73.7. Next, they tell me the Cardinals scored 855 runs. So that means the data value here that I'm going to be looking at is 855. They play in the National League. National League has a mean number of runs scored at 751.1, so that's my X bar, and a standard deviation of 78.6, so that's my S. I now have data for two different teams from two entirely different leagues. I, because they have different means, different standard deviations, come from different populations, the American League and the National League, I can't graph them on the same histogram. But if I convert them into a z-score, I can put them on the exact same curve and see where they lie relative to each other. Because if you remember that z tells me how many standard deviations above the mean either of them fall. So let's start out with the American League, the Red Sox. We find the z-score. Z equals the data value minus the mean over the standard deviation. So 949 minus 811.3 divided by 73.7. If we do the subtraction in the numerator, we get 137.7, and we're dividing by 
do that division and we get 1.868. We find the z-score for the National League Cardinals. We had a data value of 855, a mean of 751.1, and a standard deviation of 78.6. So data value minus the mean divided by standard deviation. We're going to have 855 minus 751.1 divided by 78.6. The subtraction in the numerator gives me 103.9 divided by 78.6 gives me 1.323. Because the Z-score for the Red Sox was larger. It is further from its mean. Therefore, the Red Sox had a better run producing season. If you were to look at these on a curve, let's do, let me get rid of these. Delete, delete. If you wanted to look at these on a curve to see exactly how it fell, we'll say this is your number line. I'm not very good at drawing these symmetric, but I'm going to do my best. So we're going to say the mean is somewhere about here. When you convert them to z-scores, just like we saw in that dot plot, the mean we can now think of in the z-score as a zero. So if we draw it out on this, what we call a standard normal curve, we can measure where it fell. So the z-score for the Red Sox was one point. Uh, 1.868, so somewhere about right here maybe. And the z-score for the Cardinals was about 1.3, so somewhere about right there. So when you put it on a curve, you can visually see that the Red Sox did better. Another example. Maria scored 80 out of 100 on her first stats exam and 85 out of 100 on the second one. If the teacher provided information and said on the first exam the mean was 70 and the standard deviation was 10, she got an 80 on that first exam. So on the first exam, her score was 80 the mean was 10 and the standard deviation, or the mean was 70 and the standard deviation was 10. On the second exam, her score was an 85. The mean was 80 and the standard deviation was five. So, at first glance, you'd say, well, she got an 80 on the first test and 85 on the second test, so she did better on the second test than the first test. But, as all of you know, sometimes the material is harder on one test than the other test. So she wants to know, compared with the rest of her class, on which test did she actually do better? Because if you look at the whole class, you can kind of tell how hard a test was. <clears throat> So we're going to find the z-score for her first test and her second test so we can compare them.
So if we look at the first test, I'm gonna do the first test in red. So her z-score, z-scores are found by taking the data value, subtract the mean that from the population, it came, from the uh, group that it came from and divide by the standard deviation. So her score was 80, the class averaged a 70 with a standard deviation of 10. 80 minus 70 is 10, and 10 divided by 10 is 1. So she fell one standard deviation above the mean. If we look at her second test, on the second test, she got an 85. The class average this time was an 80. And the standard deviation was 5. 85 minus 80 is 5. Standard deviation was 5, so 5 divided by 5 is 1. So even though they had a different mean and a different standard deviation, and she scored percentage-wise higher on the second test, she still fell within one standard deviation above the mean of her class. So this actually means that on both tests, she did equally well as compared to the rest of her class. Another thing you might be able to conclude is that the second exam was a little bit easier because on average, all the students scored higher and there was less variability in their scores. So since Maria only scored one standard deviation above average on both tests, she did equally well on both exams when she compares herself to everybody. Three point three. We're now going to switch to a skewed distribution. So skewed distributions, we can no longer use the mean and the standard deviation for measures of our center and spread. We're going to use something different. So for skewed distributions, our data has, if you look at the histogram, um, it appears to have a tail. Um, going off in one direction or the other. This is an example. The distribution shows the distribution of incomes for a sample of New York City residents. About half the residents have an income above 25,200 and about half have an income below 25,200. So if you were to look at these, The mean, if they were to find the mean and the median, the median is what we're going to use for these skewed distributions. If you find the mean of the data, add it all up, divide by how many you had, the mean would fall at 42.1. So it falls right where that arrow is. If you find the median, it falls at 25.2. If you notice, it's marked with a red line, it's to the left of that arrow. So what happens with our skewed data is that tail going off to the right pulled the mean to the right with that tail. So it messed up the mean as being a center, as being a measure for the center when you have skewed data. So we can't use the mean if the data is skewed. So when our data is skewed, we're going to instead use this value called a median.
So what the heck is a median? Median can be thought of as a point that divides your distribution in half. Um, you can think of it as a middle point when the data has been sorted from smallest to largest. And it's a good measure for a typical value for skewed distributions. So how do we find the median? How do we find the point that's in the middle? So I like to think of it this way. I like to think of what you're going to do is you're going to order all of your data from smallest to largest. Then you're going to count how many data values you have. That's your n. If n is an odd number, then whatever data value falls in the center is going to be your median. So, um, mm, yeah. So whatever data value falls in the center is your median. If n is even, then the median is the average of your two values that fall in the center because there's not just one data value in the middle, there's two, so you're just gonna average them. Add them together, divide by two. Um, some books to um, walk you through steps, ranking your data and calculating, you know, what number falls at the center and blah, blah, blah. I think that this is the easiest set of steps to think of it as. You can go into more detail into your own notes if you want, but I think this is um, but for a basic outline of steps, I wrote it this way because I think it's the easiest way to convey what's happening. So going back to those gas stations that we've been looking at for Austin, Texas, we're going to find and interpret the median for this data. So step one, take all the data values and put them in order. So I'm, I like to cross them off as I go so I know I don't miss something. The smallest one I see is 2.93, then 2 2.95, 2.95, 2.97, 2.99, then 2.99 again, 3.09, and 3.19. I've listed all the data values. In step two, I still have them listed, small to largest at the top. It's just not in my messy handwriting anymore. So step two, if you count how many data values you have, we have 10 data values. Since 10 is an even number, there are going to be two data values that fall in the center. So the two data values that fall in the middle are 2.99 and 2.99. Now, logically, we can say we know what the average of them is, but let's pretend that they weren't the same number, okay? So if you want to find the average, you're going to take each data value, add them together, and divide by 2. So 2.99 plus 2.99, divide by 2, we get 2.99. So that that average of those two middle values is my median. If they wanted us to interpret the answer, the median price of one gallon of gas at these gas stations in Austin, Texas, was $2.99 on this particular day in 2013. If we had a different day, the median would be different. But on this day, the median was $2.99. Look at another example. This time we're given a table. The table represents the length in seconds of random sample songs released in the 70s. We're going to find the median length of the songs. So, 
first thing I'm going to do is rewrite these in numerical order. So step one, write them in numerical order. I get 179, 201, 206, 208, 217, 222, 240, 257, and 284. For step two, they say, how many total data values did you have? We had nine data values. There were nine songs that they told us how long they were in seconds. So with that data being in order, I'm going to find the middle data value. One, two, three, four, five. It has four data values on each side. So the middle data value was 217. So that means that my median is 217. We're going to do one more example. If you haven't tried tr paused the video and tried one on your own yet, I suggest doing that. So, step 1, we'll put the data in order. We get 62, 68, 71, 74, 77, 82, 84, 88, 90, and 94. I really don't like how I wrote 74, so I'm just going to rewrite it real quick. Then we're going to say, okay, how many data values did we have? We had 10 data values. The middle values, the two values at the middle, are 77 and 82. They're an even number on each side. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. The two values in the center are 77 and 82. So I need to find their average to find the median. So 77 plus 82 is 159. If I divide that by 2, I get 79.5. That is my median. So the median score for these students in that class is 79.5. Now, obviously, if you have more than 10 data values, say you have 100 data values or 200 data values, it's really hard to do this by hand. So how do we do it in the calculator? So in our calculator, you can find the median, but you have to be able to interpret your results, okay? So to find the median, you're going to press the stat button and you're gonna edit and you'd want to enter all of your data into list one. Since I have data in here, I'm going to arrow up and highlight list one and press the clear button and enter. That clears that entire list for me. So now that I've done that, I'm going to put the data values in for that last example we did. So we had 82, 77, 90, 71, 62, 68, 74, 84, 94, and 88. You notice I just put it in the exact same way it was in the table. I didn't need to do the step, any of the steps that I did before. I don't need to put it in numerical order or anything like that. I just put it in that list. Then I'm going to press stat, arrow over to calculate, and once again we choose one variable statistics. So one var stats is the first option. 
If you hit enter, you want it to use list one and you're going to calculate. Then, you notice there's lots of things, but you see a little arrow here. That means that you can arrow down to see more things. This word MED, that's your median. So the median is MED on that list. 79.5 is the median of that last example we were looking at. It's what we calculated by hand, and it's what your calculator found. So that's how you find the center for skewed distributions. What about the spread for a skewed distribution? For a skewed distribution, the standard deviation um, was used for the distance from the mean for our symmetric distributions. Can't use standard deviation. So since we don't use the mean in distributions, we're, uh, we need a measure spread that's related to median. So standard deviation told you how many, how far you were from the mean. Since we're not using the mean, we need something that tells us how far we are from the median. So we use an entirely different measure for spread. It's called the inner quartile range. Um, it's whether or not you realize it, if you took ACTs, SATs, standardized tests and stuff, um, they use something that's based off of this interquartile range because standardized tests are not considered to be um, symmetrically distributed. We expect that they're going to have a skew distribution. Remember we talked about that last week? We expect it to be skewed, so we have to use something different. So some preliminary information. Before we can talk about what the interquartile range, we're going to refer to it as IQR, okay? Before we can talk about the IQR, we need to talk about, well, what the heck is a range and what is a quartile? Because how can I find the interquartile range if I don't know what a quartile or a range is? So a range. The range is simply the difference between a largest and smallest value. So, um... Mm. you can write an equation. You can say that the equation is that the range equals the max minus the min, maximum value minus minimum value, largest minus smallest. That's the difference. So if we look at an example, a group of eight children have the following heights in inches, 40.0, or 48, 48, 53, 53.5, 54, 60, 62, and 71. The range in the children's heights is what? So our range is the maximum value minus the minimum value. The minimum value is 48. The maximum value is 71. So 71 minus 48 is 23. There is a range of 23 inches in these children's heights. The other thing we said we needed to know what the heck they were, were quartiles. Um, there are three quartiles. They divide your data into four equal groups. And each of those groups contains 25% of your data. So I'm actually going to change the way that this is written. I'm going to say each group contains 25% of your data. Because so I think that, that makes a little more sense. So um, your first quartile is going to break up the bottom 25% from the rest of the data. The second quartile breaks your data up 50% is below it, 50% is above it. Your third quartile has 75% of the data below it and 25% above it. So just, I tend to always think of it as there being four boxes and there's some kind of number line. And on this number line, Q3, Q2, and Q1 fall. 
25% of the data is here, 25, 25, 25. It just breaks it up nice and even. So the inner quartile range is the range where 50% of your data is falling. So since quartile one and quartile three in between them is highlighted in yellow, 50% of the data would fall in between those two numbers on the number line. So the inner quartile range is just whatever number Q3 is, subtract the number for Q1. So we have to be able to find the quartiles to be able to find the inner quartile range, right? So, um, example, the dot plot shows the distribution of weights for a class of introductory statistics students. The vertical lines are breaking or slicing our distribution into four equal parts. It's breaking it up into the four quartile, four quartile groups. So they want to know um, what is the IQR. So that means where these lines are falling, these are going to be our three quartiles. Quartile one, quartile two, quartile three. Those are going to be what breaks this all up. So you guys are going, okay, well, how do I find a quartile? Greatest thing, we're not going to make you guys solve this by hand. We're only going to do these with our calculator. In this example, we have a picture so we can read them off of our graph. If you don't have a picture, you're going to use your calculator. So in this picture, the IQR is Q3 minus Q1. Q3 seems to fall at 160. Looks like Q1 is a little bit bigger than 120. So let's say 121. 160 minus 120, 121 is 39. So a range of 39 of the data of the, um, along the weight. So within 39 pounds, 50% of the weights fall within those 39 weights. That sounds really weird to say, <laughs> sorry. So how do we find this with our TI-84 calculator? In your calculator, we're still using one variable statistics. So we're gonna press stat, edit, List one, so stat, we choose the first option, which is edit, and list one. I'm gonna clear my list by hitting, by arrowing up to highlight the name of the list. I press clear and then enter, and now the list is empty. I can enter all my data into list, two, list one, then I'll press the stat button, arrow over to calculate, and choose one variable statistics. From that list, I'll be able to arrow down and actually see what Q1 and Q3 are. And then I'll be able to press, then I'll be able to by hand say the IQR is Q3 minus Q1. So let's look at some data. A group of eight children have these following heights in inches. I'm gonna enter these into my calculator, 48, 48, 53, 53.5, 54, 60, 62, and 71. We're then gonna follow all of the rules that they gave us. They told us to press the stat button, go over to calculate and choose one var stats, one variable statistics. I hit enter, I make sure list one is the list that it's using, and tell it to calculate. I can then arrow down, and I see that I'm given Q1 and Q3. So, Q1 
Q1 is 50.5. Q3 is 61. So my IQR, I take Q3 minus Q1. So 61 minus 50.5. And we get, I don't want to say anything incorrectly, especially when I'm being recorded. So 61 minus 50.5 gives me 10.5. So my interquartile range is a range of 10.5 inches in their heights. So 50% of all the students will fall within those 10.5 inches. Um, one thing you notice, the one variable statistics did not give me my Q2. The reason for this is if you look back at your, uh, where we talked about the interquartile range, that slide, the Q2 split my data in half, 50% above it, 50% below it. So it is actually your median. So Q2 equals the median. So that's just kind of like a, a fun little thing to learn. So calculator should display one variable statistics. The interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1, which is 10.50. The last section compares the measurements for the center. So going back to what we said last week, when dealing with numerical data, we use three things to describe our distribution. The three characteristics we talk about are its shape, is it symmetric or is it skewed? We use the center. If it's symmetric or skewed, we'll find either the median or the mean and the spread. For the spreads, we're either going to use the standard deviation or the interquartile range. So a more useful version of this table would tell you which data values you use for symmetric and which for skewed. So something like this might be easier to put into like a, um, like a note sheet that you can quickly and easily reference. So the primary goal is to choose your measurements that best suit your data. So you always begin with a picture, draw your histogram. Based upon your histogram, is your data symmetric or is it skewed? Once you know if it's symmetric or skewed, you can then start looking at its measures for center and spread. If it's symmetric, you'll find a mean, and the standard deviation for center and spread. If it's skewed, you find the median and the interquartile range. So choosing a measure, example, one of the authors created a data set of songs on his MP3 player. He wants to describe the distribution of song lengths. Well, the length of songs is not always the same. You often have some songs that are super duper long, right? I mean, think of if he, if he decided to add in some um, concertos by Mozart or something. Those could be, I don't even know how long those are. But so I'm going to say that I would expect the data to be skewed. And because there are always those random songs that are really long, I'm going to say that I expect it to be skewed to the right. So because I'm expecting that it's not going to be a standard distribution, I'm assuming that I'm going to end, end up having to use my median and my IQR. Now, obviously, I would want a list of his songs so I could create a histogram and see if it actually is a skewed distribution. 
Um, but yeah. So your book says, well, let's list some things that we know about songs. We know that songs can't be shorter than zero seconds. Most songs on the radio are around four minutes, but there are some songs, especially classical tracks, that are extremely long. So the shape of the distribution is probably skew right. Therefore, what we just said, we want to use the median and the IQR. If he actually gave you the data, you'd be able to put it into a histogram and find out that your assumption that it would be skewed right is correct. Most of your data falls around four minutes in track length, but there are some really long songs making it have a tail to the right. If you were to find the median in the IQR um, for that data set, it turns out the median length is 226 seconds, which is roughly 3 minutes 46 seconds long. And the interquartile range is 117 seconds. A close to a 2 minute difference. <laughs> that's, that's pretty big. So in other words, the typical track on the author's MP3 player is about 4 minutes long. And the middle 50% of the data tracks differ by about two minutes. Our mean versus our median. Some things you need to keep in mind. Skewed data has usually has outliers. So skewed data and outliers will affect your mean and your standard deviation but that really, really affects your mean. So, um, but the median and the IQR are said to be resistant, meaning they're not really affected by skewed data or outliers. So your book likes to break it down and say that if you have a skewed left distribution, the, media, the, the median is less useful than the mean. For a symmetric distribution, the mean and the median pretty much end up being the exact same number almost. Some cases exactly the same. In some cases, um, pretty darn close to each other. The mean and the median should not be far from each other in a symmetric distribution. So while we like to find the mean and use that one because it's used for the standard deviation, a lot of books say that it, it doesn't matter if you use the mean or the median. They're both a measure for the center. If your data is skewed right, um, the mean is going to be better than the median. So how does um, how does the date how does the skew or the outliers affect the mean? Well, in skewed left data, you're going to expect to see that the mean is smaller than the median. In skewed right data, the skew and those outliers are pulling the data to the right. So you'd expect the mean to come out larger than the median. So wherever your tail is, whichever way you're skewed, it pulls the mean in that direction. I think it's easier to look at a picture. So um, we talked about the mode a little bit last week. The mode, um, pretty much, it's your most common data value, remember? So it always falls pretty much right where the tallest part of your histogram is. So it's usually right where the, the hump or the top of the hill is. Um, if you have a symmetric distribution, the mean, median, and mode should be pretty darn close to the same thing. If you have a positive skew or a, um, we call it a right skew or tail, data's going off to the right. This was the only picture I could find online for you guys and I didn't want to hand draw it for you. So the right tails, it pulls your mean to the right. So it ends up being larger than the median. If you have a left tail or skew, it pulls the mean towards that tail, making it smaller than the median. So for an example of means versus medians, 
A very small fast food restaurant has only five employees, all of whom work full time, $7 an hour. So full time is 40 hours a week, $7 an hour every single week. We say that their annual income would be about $16,000 a year. Now that's what the employees make, those five employees. The owner, on the other hand, he owns the business, so he makes $100,000 a year. If we wanna find the mean and the median, and then we're gonna say, which would you use to represent the typical income at the business, the mean or the median? So if we found the mean, remember the mean is your X bar, you find it by taking all of your data values and adding them together, dividing by how many values you have. There were five employees, each makes 16,000 a year. So 16,000 five times. And then there was the one um, owner for the store who makes 100,000. So there were a total of six people that get paid, five hourly employees and the owner. If I add up my numerator, I get $180,000 divided by the six employees, and we get 30,000. So the mean says that there are 30, that the average or typical price that someone could expect to be paid in a year working there would be $30,000. For the median, there are 10 data values. So we must average the two middle data values. Average the two middle. So 16,000 plus 16,000, if I divide by two, I get 16,000 is my median. Now, looking at these, if you were to see on, let's say you went to indeed.com and you wanted to apply for a job at this company, which do you think is more truthful, the mean or the median? Well, obviously the median is more truthful. It's best because the mean got pulled by that owner's salary. It got pulled and made higher when in fact the most common salary, the thing that you expect to see people making is what the median value is, the $16,000. So you have to be very careful and make sure that you're looking at the values that are best for your data. Because if you tell someone, well, the app, you know, the average salary at this company is $30,000 and they get hired and they're only making 16,000, which is half that, they're gonna be wondering what the hell is going on. So the median income, since the data is skewed, is better representation. The mean ended up being larger than the median because the data was skewed to the right. So that mean got pulled to the right. Comparing different distributions. When you compare two different distributions, we always use the same measure for the center and spread for both distributions. Otherwise, the comparison isn't valid. If one of the distributions is skewed, we'd use the median and the IQR to compare both distributions. So if they're both symmetric, we use the mean and the standard deviation. If one is symmetric and one is skewed, 
you're going to use the median and the IQR. So an example, comparing the distributions of running times for amateur athletes and Olympic athletes for marathons. It's listed below. The amateur marathon runners are skewed to the right. Um, the Olympic are a little bit closer to being symmetric, but you could still argue that they're skewed to the right. So if you wanted to compare their average running times for amateurs and Olympics, you would find the median. The median for the amateurs is 266 I'm minutes. Then for the Olympic marathon runners, their median is 155 minutes. That's a pretty big difference. You can see why they're Olympians. So the Olympic runners are skewed right. The amateur runners, oh, they said they were fairly symmetric. Okay. So since the amateur runners were fairly symmetric, but the Olympic were skewed right, skew right, you always use the median. Um, even though amateurs were fairly symmetric, we have to use the median since the other group was skewed. So a typical woman Olympic runner finishes a marathon considerably faster. A median time of 154.8 minutes as compared to 240 minutes. So 2.6 hours to 4 hours. That's a big difference in how fast people finish those marathons. Our last bit of data. Using box plots to display summaries. So the box plots and the summaries, um, I'll wait to say that, okay. So finding outliers, um, outliers are extreme data values. They're things that don't really fit at all with the rest of your data. Outliers will distort your data. They'll pull the mean and the standard deviation away from what the true values would be. Because almost all statistical analysis relies on means and standard deviations, in a real world situation, um, conclusions from data with outliers can often be flawed. So in the real world, there are a lot of statisticians that will remove outliers. But if you ever remove an outlier, you have to tell people that you've done that. You can't just be like, I'm just gonna throw out this data value because I don't think it works for the rest of the information. <laughs> That's not something you're allowed to do. Um, because those outliers are part of your population. There is someone who is represented by that thing. So um, some people like to throw out outliers. Then there's those people that are diehard saying you can't throw out an outlier. You just have to make sure that you tell everyone that the data could have been influenced by that outlier and blah, blah, blah. So there are two camps in the statistical field, some arguing for keeping them in, some that argue for throwing them out. Um, we're not going to be worrying about that. We're just going to figure out if we can find if something is an outlier. Okay. So how do we find an outlier for these skewed data? For the skewed data, we're going to be using quartiles, right? So to check for an outlier using the quartiles. Step one, you find your first and your third quartiles of your data. So we use our calculator, right? Step two, find the inner quartile range. So quartile three minus quartile one. Then you're gonna find something called a fence. These fences are what serve as cutoff points for determining outliers. If anything is outside of these fences, we'll end up calling them outliers. So to find the lower fence, you take quartile one and you're gonna subtract 1.5 multiplied by IQR. To find the upper fence, you take quartile three and add 1.5 times the IQR. Anything that's less than the lower fence or greater than the upper fence is an outlier. So finding our outliers, let's actually try an example. The first and third quartiles in the distribution of daily high temperatures for San Francisco were 59 and 70. 
So Q1 is 59, Q3 is 70. Using these values, what temperatures would be considered outliers for San Francisco? So I already have my first and third quartiles, so I'll find my interquartile range. 70 minus 59 equals 11. Then I find my lower fence. Quartile 1 minus 1.5 times the IQR. So 59 minus 1.5 times 11. So 59 minus 16.5 equals 42.5. For quartile three, it's 70. So the upper fence is 70 plus 1.5 times 11. So 70 plus 16.5 gives me 86.5. So we can say that any temperature that is below 42.5 degrees Fahrenheit or above 86.5 degrees Fahrenheit would be an outlier. So using our interquartile range and our quartiles, we can find fences and figure out if there's any outliers in our data. So we can report it. So we can say, hey, these were outliers. They could be skewing my results. Um, something that is kind of a visual representation of these um, interquartile ranges and what's happening with your data is a box plot. They help you to visualize certain summary statistics. They show where the bulk of your data is gonna lie. And um, a box is drawn. Basically what it is, is you draw a box from Q1 to Q3. You have a number line on the bottom that tells you how to um, scale your data. So you have Q1 to Q3 is one big rectangular box. And inside of it, you're gonna put a line for your median. Outside of that, you're gonna draw something called a whisker. So Q1, Q3, your median falls somewhere in there. Outside of it, you'll have whiskers, which just think of it like a cat face. It's something that sticks out on either side. They are drawn to the most extreme values within the fences. So Stream values that don't fall outside, or any stream value that goes outside of it is an outlier. These are extreme values that aren't outside of that. So they stop at your lower fence and at your upper fence. Um, I will tell you that some books, some people draw the whiskers a little differently. They make the lower whisker they make the whisker on the left-hand side equal to the minimum. Um, I don't know, I can't remember off the top of my head since this is how your books described it, I'm thinking that they're gonna have it as your lower whisker and your upper whisker equal to your lower fence and your upper fence. But if you happen to see that lower whisker being replaced with the minimum data value, um, that's why it happens because sometimes they just put the minimum in. So potential outliers are then marked outside of these with an asterisk, so little asterisk. There's an outlier out there. The caution that you're given is that box plots work best for unimodal data. So what they do is they allow you to hide the fact that you have more than one hill in your data. Um, 
and where a histogram might not be as easy as to use, these box plots can help you see what's going on more easily. So, an example, box plot for the daily high temperatures in San Francisco are given below. The box is created using Q1, the median, and Q3. You have a number line down here at the bottom that lets you space everything out. So Q1 falls at 59, Q3 is at 70, and in between that is the median. It makes one big rectangle. What it's nice is looking at the median inside there, you can kind of see um, how that inner 50% of data is broken up. Is it broken up evenly? Is the median roughly in the middle? Is the median falling closer to one side, making two smaller, making a smaller rectangle and a bigger rectangle? Um, it allows you to kind of see if it's skewed by doing that. Then, uh, looks like your book might be using the minimum as where it cuts off for this lower whisker. And then you go for the upper whisker is your upper fence. It's the largest value that's not greater than 86.5. It's your upper fence. And then outside of that are any potential outliers. So the minimum data value is 49. The median, you can read it as 64. And you can count how many potential outliers there were. There were five. <clears throat> Box plots comparing two different distributions. Both distributions have roughly the same, we've already talked about this, we said that they have roughly the same symmetry, they're both roughly symmetric. They have roughly the same centers at 67 and 65, and the spread for both distributions be, is different. Now we said that Provo was more spread out and San Francisco was less spread out. When we look at this though, we notice that San Francisco really only had one, it was unimodal. There was really only one hill. If we look at Provo, we notice that it had two hills. So while we can look at everything we've been studying, it might be helpful to look at the box plots. It'll give us a way to stack them on top of each other and see what's happening with our data. So if you were to look at the box plots, stack them vertically on the same thing, San Francisco's on top, Provo's on the bottom. We can easily see that Provo is more spread out than San Francisco, and we can see that San Francisco has outlined data temperatures. We can also see that anything above, uh, I don't know what that's, 80 something, anything above 80 something in San Francisco is gonna be considered an outlier. It's gonna be weird to have a temperature above that. So, um, for example, both cities have 100 degrees. San Francisco, that would be an outlier to have a 100 degree day. In Provo, while it's an extreme value, it's not an outlier. So it kind of helps you to compare things a little bit. Kind of like that Z table helped us compare things. So um, there's something called the five number summary. Um, a good bit of it is used to create the box plot but it's another quick, easy way to summarize um, most of the information that's in your box plot um, in just numbers that you can quickly and easily look at. They are your minimum, your quartile one, your median, your quartile three, and your maximum. Now, if you look at this output that we still have up over here on our calculator, our calculator gives us all of these values, your minimum, your quartile one, your median, quartile three, and maximum, right there at the bottom of your 
um, print out or load out, whatever you want to call it, it has those five numbers that create your five number summary. So if we look at a box plot, consider the box plot for those daily high temperatures in San Francisco. We can create our five number summary by looking at a box plot and then we'll talk about the calculator. So the first thing is always your minimum. In this case, it was 49. Your quartz aisle one was 59. Your median was 64. Your quartile three was 70. And your maximum value, you look at the outliers. The largest value along those outliers fell, it looks like at about 97. So that would be my five number summary. If I want to use my calculator, my calculator can spit out that five number summary and it can create box plots for me. So I'm going to do both. I'm going to have it give me my five number summary with the one variable statistics so I can write those down. But then I'm going to go through these steps to create a box plot. So let's first just do the five number summary. So for the five number summary, we're going to go to statistics. We're going to edit. I'm going to arrow up and highlight list one press clear and enter. It erases my list. And then I'm gonna enter all the data values that they're giving me. The data shown in the table shows the finishing time in minutes for men in the 60 to 64 year old age group of a specific five kilometer race. 19 23.25, 23.32, 25.55, uh, 25.83, 26.28, 28.58, 28.57, 30.18, 30.19, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 30.25, 
it's all in list one. So I'm gonna press the second button and then the Y equals button. It opens all of those stat plots. I'm gonna choose the first one, plots one. Right now it says it's off, I'm gonna hit enter. It's flashing over the word on. I'm gonna hit enter to turn it on. Then I'm gonna go down to where it says type and I'm gonna arrow over to, it, it's probably the fourth option on yours. It has um, what looks like a rectangle with some little dots outside of it. Those are showing that it's gonna do it with outliers. You want that one. The other one doesn't have little dots outside of it so it doesn't find outliers for you. So we want the one with the little dots. We're gonna hit enter so that one's highlighted. We're using list one. I always just leave frequency as one, let it be where it is. You can choose whatever mark you want. And I, um, because I'm using the colored edition so that hopefully it'll be a little easier for you guys to see, I get to pick colors. You guys don't have that option, um, except for Andrew who has a color version. So I'm gonna let mine be blue. Then, because I wanna make sure that it all shows up properly, I'm gonna press the Y equals button and make sure that I don't have anything entered in here. If I did, I would hit clear and make it go away. If we press the zoom button, the ninth option says zoom stat. So your calculator is gonna take all the information that you plugged into your lists in stat and it's going to create a window for you so that you shouldn't have to play with the window settings at all. So if you do that, zoom stat, the ninth option, arrow down to it and press enter, you will get your box plot with outliers. From this, I can easily see that I have one outlier for my data. So this entire histogram or this entire table data table has one outlier and it's that data value of 64.63. It's outside of the normal and so it would be something that if you were doing a um, report for someone or a study you'd be like hey there is an outlier it's 64.63. It might influence my data. So that, you know, anyone else who wanted to recreate your results, if they did their own study and they got really different results, they'd be like, why did that happen? Oh, it happened because they had an outlier and my data didn't, or something. Let's try one more example and then you guys are done. So a group of eight children have the following heights in inches. So I have to press my stat button, go to edit, and I'm gonna arrow up to list one, hit clear and enter to erase everything that's in there. Then I can enter my data values, 48, 48, 53, 53.5, 54, 60, 62, and 71. Whoops. And one of them got entered incorrectly. So I arrow up and it was 53.5. Now, double checking, everything looks good. Now that I have all my data in, second stat plot, I hit enter, I make sure that the data's turned on, that the plot's turned on, that it's the kind of box plot I want, the X list is list one, we're using the mark that I want for my outliers. I'm gonna press zoom and go to the ninth option. I have different data in my stat list now, so I'm gonna need a different window. That's why I'm gonna mess with the zoom buttons because it's gonna tell me what my, it's gonna give me a window automatically based upon what my data was. So zoom stat, I hit enter and it pulls up the graph. I have a box plot. I don't see any outliers, but I can see that the whisker on the right is bigger and the rectangle on the right, that side of the rectangle is bigger 
than the left side. So this data is actually going to be skewed right if you were to look at it. So that is everything for chapter three. I hope all of you have a wonderful week. I'm sorry that we couldn't meet. And I will talk to y'all later. Email me if you have any questions. I've never done this before, so let's see if I can stop my video now. <laughs> let's see. Time player. Stop screen recording.